Hey guys, it's Micah Young, the host of another Philosophical Tuesday. Thank you for joining us as we take time to smell the philosophical roses. In today's podcast, we pick up where we left off in our last episode, with a discussion of natural rights and the government's role in embodying those rights. Specifically, we distinguish between natural and legal rights, positive and negative rights, and equity versus equality. We also explore the relation of rights to power and wealth disparity. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy this episode. And welcome to another Philosophical Tuesday, the podcast where it's Christmas in November. Uh, my name is uh, my name is uh, David. Um, at least that's my middle name. Um, I also have a first name. It is Micah. Um, I am here with uh, with the the man of of uh, the the Rebel Alliance man himself, uh, Joshua Charlton. That's me. I am the the sole founder, creator, and and controller of the Rebel Alliance, um, and. Uh, I will one day supplant the emperor and and take his place as the emperor and 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 throw the just throw the whole empire into a state of absolute chaos as I take my my uh I'll be just I'll, it's just gonna be great like look forward to it. I am um, forward to it. Yeah, I bet. Uh, you know, I'm here with uh the the as ever just stunningly and the the, the just flaming hair. And and flaming all around, Josh Smith. I speak Wookie. That was the worst Wookie impression I have ever heard. I'm an outcast. As Wookiee. a founder of the Rebel Alliance, I was born I can with a speech impediment. Wholeheartedly endorse that this uh, this horribly disabled Wookie. <laughs> also, next week, whenever we introduce Josh Smith, we're not allowed to say anything about his hair because. You do have to find a better introduction. Th- that's, for him. He, at this point, he's just the ginger, and that's 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 all he is. Yes. Well, I'm Josh, the ginger, that's, whose that's hair you cannot be, see. Let's be honest. <laughs> that's that's the only reason I'm on this podcast because they feel bad for me as a minority. Yeah. Anyways, um, I'm here we with had our to have ho- some representation. <laughs> I'm here with our host, Micah. Yes, I, I realized that I have now been introduced twice because for some reason today I felt the need to introduce myself when I when I started the podcast. So I. I'm. I have been doubly introduced, so I feel as is only fitting for the supreme I, leader. I, I, I second I, that. Does that mean that Josh, when you become emperor, that I'll, I'll still be the supreme leader? No, no. it's okay. They'll just kill me off in this. Only they'll just one. kill me off in the there second only movie and give no explanation for where I came from. So, yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's okay. Pretty much. That's the goal. Okay, so today we're going to be talking, picking up a little bit of our conversation last week talking about uh, uh, the role and purpose of government last week. And, and today we're going to at least start out by uh, driving the conversation in uh, sort of a, a natural rights kind of direction, uh, talking about natural rights versus legal rights. Uh, Josh Smith, do you want to give a little bit uh, a little bit of the introduction that you were given before we, before we officially kick things off here? Sure. So we were basically talking about how Legal rights are the rights that government gives its citizens. It's the rights that are made explicit or implicit through laws and through the actions of the government in relation to its citizens. Those legal rights are opposed to natural rights often, which are higher principles that the government may or may not seek to embody, but that are viewed as above and they, they supersede the government in, in a certain sense. And that's why when the founders of the U.S. government created the Constitution, they described certain inalienable rights that individuals have, life, liberty, property, the pursuit of happiness, Locke and Jefferson and all that. So, yeah, what we're basically looking at is where has this gone wrong? Were the founders justified in putting forward the natural rights that they did? Are they actually 
like divine in a certain sense what's going on with all this basically so are we are we are we focusing in on the government of the united states and the 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 model of the u.s government i think i think that the u.s model of government is a great place to use as an example because it's the probably most explicit it's the it's the nation in which the doctrine of natural rights is most explicitly defended and supported within its very structure and so i think it's useful as an example although our conversation does not in any way have to be limited to the u.s government and i think we are just for for clarity's sake i think we are assuming for the sake of this conversation we we kind of discussed this last time that really in order to even be able to have these kinds of conversations we have to assume that there is a sort of uh objective higher standard and higher value than is than is in kind of enshrined in, in as you should say law that there is such a thing as natural right, rights because without without that concept you can't even have the debate as to whether or not some governments are good or bad or failing or not failing you just you can't even have that discussion without having some kind of objective standard to hold them to so we are when we're going yeah, into and- this conversation we're assuming that there is such a thing as natural rights maybe not what those things are but we do assume that they well, exist. And to be even to to clarify your point a bit, um, we are, in a certain sense, not addressing the arguments that rights come from power. Because, sure, you could make the argument that that natural rights are only rights in this if there is power that is able to enforce those rights. In that case, you could but make that you argument. Could make, no, but that, in that case, they would not, by definition, be de- uh, natural rights. That that's that's that what our, that's really that's what our su- conversation to have at some point. Though. Yes, but that's I would what like our to have that conversation. Not today, but that would be an interesting conversation. Maybe to have. we could talk about that. Yes, next that's time. what our presupposition has to yeah. be, though, for this discussion. It has to be that yeah. that natural rights are something other than gained through power. They right. they are un- unique and and intrinsic to our humanity something about our humanness grant it is is fundamentally divine in a certain sense and that divinity is is what give is what gives us natural rights as human beings okay so we're let's just yeah so we're going forward we're assuming natural rights are a thing they, they exist, exist. they're Moving um on. we we're, we're not going to assume that they're defined we're going to assume that they're objective not defined by by individuals on the basis of uh beliefs or actions so we're really we're really going to be measuring up the idea of of government law against natural rights um yeah it does become a little bit tricky i i I wonder if we need to for the sake of this do we need to actually define what like what natural rights are in order to have this conversation like as far as as far as like specifics like, like give specific examples like, of this is a natural right. Yeah, because if we're if we're if we're measuring up kind of a government's ability to succeed in upholding a na- or to succeed or 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 to fail in upholding a particular natural right through their through law, right? Don't we do we need to know going into that what those rights actually are in order to have that conversation? I think we do, and I'd be willing to have a longer discussion if necessary to get down into the specifics. Sure, so let's let's de- come up with and define some of the some of let's come up with a, a short list at least of things we believe are natural rights. And and why don't we why don't we for the sake of this conversation because that that is like again you could write many oh, many books course. about that. Why don't we for the sake of this conversation assume that the natural rights that we're talking about are the ones that are kind of commonly understood in, in kind of Western philosophy as being sure Western rights. and we're not going to try to justify we're not going to try to justify it we're not going to try to debate it we're just going to assume that those are the natural rights for the sake of this conversation because I think that if if we don't we're going to end up in the weeds here and and it will it will end up being I mean that's that is that is that is many many hours of discussion in and of itself is that fair you guys agree with that I think that's fair no I think that makes sense I mean we'll have to have a little bit of discourse as to what exactly are the natural rights we want to enforce but n- not no major discussion on yeah we just well, can't afford it in the course of one conversation we can't afford right to do right that, i think pretty straightforwardly 
life, liberty, and property are the three main natural rights that are emphasized in the documents of the Founding Fathers. I agree, and I also would say that those are both, those are natural rights in their negative sense, in the sense that you have, you have a right to life in the sense that you have the right not to be killed, you have the right to uh, happiness in the right that you have not, in in the sense that you have the right not to be impeded in your pursuit of that, you have the right to property in the sense that you have the right not to be impeded, not to be stolen from, but it does not mean that you have the right to, uh, if you, it's not, they're not positive rights in the sense that if you are uh, in a bad way, you have the right to force someone else to come yes. and take care of you and prolong your life. Well, and so that's an important distinction. And a quick note on one of the things you mentioned, you said the right to happiness, but it's actually the right to the pursuit of happiness. And the difference right. is you don't have the right to be happy. Like, and I think I said, I think I said pursuit of happiness. That's an important yes, distinction. You, you to did point at one out, point. But... I just wanted to make the distinction for for any listeners right. because it's it's really a fundamental distinction in today's age because we we tend to view happiness as a right nowadays and if we are not happy then it must be some fault of the government or some fault of society at large and 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 the reason we think that way is because we view it as a natural right but that's not what the founding fathers thought they thought that the pursuit of happiness was was a right and so if you thought you would be happy through doing something you had the right to pursue that thing but you did not have the right to hold someone else accountable if you did not find happiness right. through that thing and so it's important it is important that we make that mm-hmm. distinction because a lot of people do look at those things and they say oh i have a right to life that means i have a right to free health care yeah like, no you have a right not to be shot and killed that's what you have the right to that's what that right means or at the very least Doesn't mean you have the right to force somebody else to take care of you when you have medical costs yeah and and in the sense that you don't have the so you have the right not to be shot what what that boils down to though is your right to life is what that entails is that your life is something precious and worthwhile and something that is worth being defended that does not mean that it is some sort of governmental or societal flaw if you happen to get shot but what it does mean is that you don't have the right to shoot others and that you, you don't have you have the legal right not to be shot so a good government will will in its legal set in the legal sense prohibit people from shooting other people because they are deriving that from the natural law which mm-hmm. give, which gives you the right to life right okay so we've got life um, we've so we've mentioned life liberty and liberty property and the pursuit of happiness does liberty and the pursuit of happiness are they are they sort of the same thing? Because I don't think we really defined liberty. No, we didn't. Okay, because I th- so liberty is a bit of a broader term what? than some of these other ones. <laughs> I think it's just it's just freedom. It's the freedom to live your life as you see. Which is fit. also the same as the want. freedom to pursue happiness for the pursuit of happiness as you see fit. In a certain but, but way, the key, the key again is, and, and we talk about that in the negative sense. The key to that is that. You have the right to pursue things, to pursue and live your life the way that you see fit, so long as that does not involve forcing others to do something mm-hmm. in pursuit of that. So you have the right to do what you want, so long as that only affects you. You don't have the right to to. I want to be happy, therefore I or I want to be I want to I want to be free, therefore I have the right to um, my my freedom. The things that will make me truly free is the freedom to go and and maybe shoot somebody. Right? Mm-hmm. You don't have that freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the founding fathers and philosophers around that time often saw liberty when they when they said liberty, they were often referring to to liberty of the individual from government. So it was something specific, and they. At that time, American philosophers were often looking at Britain and saying, the British government is not treating us as if we have any liberty, any any agency of our own. And so we are going to part ways, and that really was to them liberty, part ways with Britain and make our own choices as, as our own government. Um, and so it was pretty political at that time. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Um, another one that um, I'd like to add to the list is um, the right to um, 
<sighs> freedom of speech. Um, we can we can broaden that if you will. Um, if if possible, we can broaden that, or if we can keep it keep it narrow or keep it as just freedom of speech, if you guys want. Can can't that be just contained in the in the idea of liberty? Well, all of these could be a lot of these could be contained in the idea of liberty, right? Um, maybe I guess I guess the right to life and, and to property is is a bit more is is a bit different than the right to liberty. Um, pursuit of pursuit of property is I, mean, I'd say, I would say pursuit of, pursu- I would again differentiate pursuit of property. Um, but but uh, you know the idea of you know I I I do think that you're going to be hard pressed. I mean it's a, it's a it's it's a clever statement. You know, life, liberty, pursuit of property. Um, they they changed it to pursuit of happiness, but but originally it was pursuit of property. Mm. Um, and and it would be hard. It would be hard. You would be hard pressed to find if you were to go through, say, the the, the Bill of Rights or any of the other amendments to the Constitution. You would be hard to find. You would be hard pressed, I think, to find a right in there that couldn't be uh, summarized within one of those three things. Yeah, and and um philosophers have often argued about property as well that's one thing that distinguishes humans from from inanimate things specifically inanimate things but also just other things in general so you can't buy or sell another human being like this is hegel because of personhood personhood is something that prevents you from being part of a transaction like that whereas property is something that you can own something that you can transfer between persons um, and so property was often viewed as something like you, the government cannot just come in and take something that is yours because it is yours, not only in the legal sense, but it is yours because you, you actually own that thing. Yeah. It would be an interesting conversation to have, and this doesn't have to be today, mm-hmm. but, but is it a, is it a violation of those fundamental principles? If I wanted to sell myself into slavery? It's an interesting it's an interesting question because fundamentally the thing that separates a person from a, a piece of property is is agency. Um and and, and ultimately um that's why we, we call it a you don't you, you can buy a contract from somebody, right? You can buy an agreement, but you can't buy a person themselves. Um, so yeah, that, that would definitely be an interesting one to get into. Well, it's like the idea of liberty. Like like do I have the, do I have the liberty to give up my liberty? Yeah. Is that a is that is that something that I is that a freedom that I actually have? Yeah, and that's you know it's interesting. And define that's a good that. question. How, how could you Same say thing, like do I have do I have the right to give up is, my is life it, if yeah. I were to commit suicide? Is that something that is 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 legitimate? Well, and do I have the right to do that. I think it, it the as you mentioned, Josh, there were negative connotations that came along with those rights, and I think I think, but I'm not sure that the way the founding fathers saw it was that. They were also negative in the sense that you were denying your humanity if you if you did something like that. If you mm. sold yourself as property, if you killed yourself, you were denying your own personhood, and therefore you were going against the fundamental principles that they were founding the country on. Yeah, that's interesting. But um, yeah, and I sure. and even to clarify with what you said, Micah, on agency, um. I think moral agency specifically is probably a better term to use to differentiate humans from other things because animals, for instance, have agency to some extent. Well, we we have more that that can be debated. We but we have moral, moral agency, agency and moral decisions. Um, we we also have. I guess I'm I'm thinking more in terms of um, how how one possesses something, right? So when you possess mm. and, and 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 so I guess um. And, and it, a dog cannot choose to be uh, owned by somebody. Um, it does not choose to be Correct. owned by somebody. It can it can choose to uh, misbehave, but it can't it, it can't choose whether or not somebody it can't choose the the response to other. It has no rights, uh, and maybe that's that's a better way. Of it cannot it. claim that its rights are being abused because it has been transferred from one person to. Another. Yeah, it can't claim it. Not just because it has no claim to it, but because it literally cannot claim that. It, it is it lacks it, it the lacks ability. the ability to claim that. It, it lacks the ability to um, truly um, protest. You know, um, 
Because it doesn't know yeah, exactly what's I, happening. Right. Yeah, and I, I do think that freedom of expression is an important an important natural right that is a subset of liberty. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I think we have a good list going for at least to get mm-hmm. for us at least to get an idea of where we're going with this conversation. So Josh, do you want to maybe take us into the main main point here? This is kind of your this is your your mind project here. <laughs> what do you... Well, I mean, some well, what I was thinking about today was how are we messing this up, right? Because we have these natural rights that have been in a certain sense, taken for granted throughout history, especially in the modern world, in the modern Western world. And nowadays, we we tend to think of rights as being derived from government. And maybe you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't claim that, but let's look at the, the way we practically view the legal system. If we believe that gay rights or trans rights or whatever kind of rights, like the, these might be important rights to stand for, but what we tend to do is we tend to go to the the legal system and say, okay, these need to become rights. We need to put it into law that these are rights. And that that might be a noble cause, who knows? But the problem is that you're making the, the definition of rights murky. What exactly are rights? And that's something I think we've lost through trying to impose upon others through government I mean, certain rights over at the behest of others. It seems to me that the fundamental issue here is that we have legally, we have made this conflation between negative and positive rights. So we have taken what were intended to be kind of rights in these negative sense, in, in the negative sense that you have the right, you have the right to life in the sense that you have the right not to have others impede your life. Mm-hmm. And then we've taken those, or the right to liberty in the sense that you have the right not to have others come in and 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 prevent you from doing the things that you want to do, but not that you have the right to force other people to do anything. So you have you have you have your right to liberty only insofar as you're not impeding somebody else's rights rights right. And 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 so then what we've done is we've gone through, and then that would be I think the smart way to do it. It's the way the founders intended. But then you come through and you say, okay, well, these things are actually now positive rights. So now your right to liberty is such that if it makes you happy, if it's something that you want, you can force somebody else to do something or say something, right? That's what you're seeing a lot with like the transgender issue, right? You have Hmm. the right to force somebody else to do something for you or say something for you or interact with you in a certain way that you find most comfortable because you have the right to be happy or, or be free. Mm -hmm. And, and you have interpreted that right to mean that because I have the right to do this, I can therefore intrude on somebody else's rights and force them to do something. And so a lot of these legal measures, these legal kind of protections that we're seeing aren't actually protections. They're, they're actually forcing other people to do something or speak in a certain way or act in a certain way so as to so as to uh grant you a right in a positive sense which ultimately which ultimately i think always and i think what we're going to find in the course of this conversation is that if you interpret a right positively as opposed to negatively that always means intruding on uh, intruding on someone else what someone else's rights i don't think it's possible Mm -hmm. to interpret any of these rights positively without intruding on the rights of someone else and it comes back to power again wasn't it wasn't it Rousseau that argued that there were no ra- natural rights and that the only natural rights, the only rights that exist come from the sovereign? Isn't that Rousseau? I, I might so. be wrong yeah. about that. I think it's Rousseau. Anyways, he he basically argued there were no natural rights and they all came from the sovereign. And so I think what you're getting at, Josh, is that it's it's an attempt to kind of mix natural rights with legal rights. But what it's ending up doing is making power or enforceability the standard by which to gauge whether something is a right which leads us back to this fundamental question in the first place which is 
are rights natural, or do they exist only when acted upon by a more powerful what, force? What, what makes you say that they're mixing um, the idea of natural rights with the idea of, of legal rights, specifically? I, I guess the reason I, I right, ask yeah. that is because we have this idea of what a natural right is. And in, in our articulation of a natural right, we've talked about them being expressed in the negative. Um, it yes. sounds to me like, while many people... I, I meant... Yeah, go ahead. Less that it was a, a mix and more that it, there's a transition going on from natural rights to, to, I guess, some sort of rights from power sure. in, in the collective narrative. But continue with your train of thought. No, I mean, I, mean, I, I guess it's, it, it's not as if, um, it's, it's not as if we, we all still have the, the idea. I mean, some of us have the idea that these are natural rights, I suppose. And some of us have the idea that they should be realized in a positive sense. Um, but, but nobody who's really advocating, you know, the whole point of the natural rights is, again, it, it, it ultimately comes down to, um, we might say it could even all be summed up in, in liberty, right? Um, the the right to be mm. an individual and and to to act with with you know agency and to make decisions. Um, that's you know that's kind of the right to you have to be alive to do that. Um, you have to have something to make decisions about. So you have to have some some sort of property or some sort of uh, impact. Um, and, and the decision itself is is liberty. Um, Nobody who truly believes that those are natural rights is going to start advocating for them in a positive sense um, without realizing that they're they're sort of removing the, the whole point of the right to begin with. So I guess I guess well they may not realize that they may be advocating for those things genuinely, but they may not realize that you may for example, let's say you think you have the right to to property not just the pursuit of property in the negative mm -hmm. sense that that you have the right not to have your property taken from you and you have the right to act in a way that it frees you to gain property but that you have the positive right to if you don't have property you must therefore have property bestowed upon you right if you if you believe in that and you also believe that say money is a completely artificial abstract concept that there actually really isn't such a thing as value it's just kind of the societal construct which i think what a lot of people right now are pushing this kind of modern monetary theory which suggests that you know really money is just this it's just a human construct it doesn't actually mean anything it's just something kind of invented by the patriarchy in order to force oppression down on people so why not just do away with that why not just print money and hand it to people it doesn't mean anything right if you believe that there's no actual if you believe that the systems that that uh, if you believe that, that the the concept of property itself is kind of arbitrary um, and and societally uh, kind of societally constructed, and you believe that you have the right to that kind of positively, you don't have to believe that you're hurting anybody because you don't believe that the, the property really had any value in the first place. It's just completely societally constructed, so we can just. But but, we but in that case, do you actually believe that prop, you have a right to property, or does it just mean you have a right to be the same as everyone else? Because that's that's not because well, that's if you good, don't believe that property has question. any meaning, if you don't believe that money has any meaning, and and again, I, I guess I'm in that case, I might just be picking on your and, and it is. I'm not saying it's not, it is kind of contradictory, but it is. But you can see how somebody could kind of fudge this in their head in such a way that. Well, well, yes, I could have the positive right to this thing without tramping on somebody else's rights because we can just kind of, you know, the underlying ideas are, are actually kind of arbitrary anyway. So it is, it is kind of contradictory in the way that you would suggest, right? Which is, that, which is that really, if you actually believe those things are arbitrary, why would you be advocating for the right anyway? Yeah, and that, that really it is, it's stems weird. down to I'm not what... It's not well, natural rights in the first place, the whole idea was... They are natural. They speak for themselves. And yes, it is important to, to in a certain sense, label what they are and categorize them and, and put out statements regarding them. But the idea originally was that they are so powerful that we do not even need to defend them. Um, and it's almost the opposite mm -hmm. with this, this 
just trying to push for something. Well, it seems to me that as soon as you start to advocate the positive of these, and I think you kind of touched on this earlier, uh, Charlton, as soon as you start to advocate the positive of these, they, they sort of implode on themselves, right? As soon as you think, you can do this with all three of them. So as soon as you start saying that the right to property is not just the right not to be stolen from, but it's actually the right to have things. If you have a right to have things, those things have to come from somewhere. And unless you actually go out and get those things, um, you're going to have to take them from some, unless you actually go out and make those things or, or earn those things, you're going to have to take them from somebody. They don't just magically come out of nowhere. So immediately, in order to have the positive of the right to property, you're going to have to have the negative of the right. Uh, you're going to have to have the, you're going to be violating the negative. In Yeah. And I guess that's kind of what I was getting at mm -hmm. there, which is that if you believed that, if you believed that say the government had the ability to create value mm -hmm. that value was such a thing that it could be created out of nothing because it's kind of an arbitrary concept then then there isn't i mean it, it's kind of a silly presupposition and it's not i think an accurate mm -hmm. one but it does kind of remove that 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 block in people's heads i think that's how i think that's how people mm -hmm. justify it because i think the people advocating for that aren't thinking in terms of okay i'm stealing this from somebody and maybe some of them are i think some of them definitely are some of them may, may look at this as a, a sense of you have things, therefore you need to be punished. But but there's also, I think, a certain attempt to justify it in the sense that actually we can just kind of create value out of nothing. Because And this and this ties into, I think, the idea of the power dynamic that, that Josh was talking about, right? Which is that ultimately money, you know, the idea of value itself is something that has to be enforced from power. So if we can enforce the creation of more value mm. through the use of the government, uh, you know, it, it is, it's a weird hodgepodge of these two mm -hmm. ideas as Josh. And I think this, I think it's probably what Josh is getting at, right? This, this kind of weird Frankenstein combination of these two ideas, um, because that's, they're using the idea that, that, that these rights could be enforced through, through just power that we could just kind of forcibly print more money and force people to accept it from a position of power and that that can be used to justify our our interpretation of rights in a kind of positive sense without uh without robbing somebody else you know without delving into that kind of immorality. well i mean it, it 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 powers becomes the only thing that's meaningful right i mean as soon as you start yeah. to enforce it i mean that's the thing the, the idea of property just sorts of starts to break down it's like you said it's like people just start to think well property is just a construct it's just you know it's 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 something people an idea people have created to gain power so the only and then you really do start to lose the idea of natural mm -hmm. rights don't you yeah mm -hmm. well the the other thing i was going to say is that this whole idea of breaking thing of, of starting to break down um once you once you apply the positive can can really um can really work for all three of these so so liberty We've already talked about, you know, um, in order for, you know, say somebody wants to be be referred to using different words. So I'm going to refer to them as, as they, them or ZZ, you know, um, it, somebody believes that it's their their right to pursue happiness. They want people to call them that, except that immediately impinges on the negative of, of liberty. And, and for life, um, we talked about the right to, to free health care. The problem is immediately whenever you start to give people free health care, you immediately start taking part of the right to life, we might say, is the right to your own time, the right to use of your your own time and resources. And um, in order to in order for somebody to be um, kept from death, it requires somebody stepping in and, and, and filling that that role. Where does this stem from, do you think? What's the source of this drive to advocate for rights of all kinds? What do you mean rights of all kinds? Do you mean rights in the positive and the negative sense? Yes. And it, it, it seems as if there is a push to almost make everything good a, a right to the point at which it almost becomes so cluttered with rights. And, and I'm not necessarily viewing this in a negative sense. I think rights are important, and we've already established that, that there is something fundamental to humanity 
that that is intrinsic that carries with it certain divine properties and so this should speak for everyone in a certain sense well i i think it's a fundament i think fundamentally it's a misreading of human nature because if you believe that human beings are kind of infinitely malleable they're constructs of their society and that all of these ideas things like I, things like property are nothing more than societal constructs that are kind of arbitrarily enforced by you know evolved by societies in order to oppress people which i think is what a lot of people are believing right now what 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 i think that leads to ultimately is this belief that well if we just if if human beings are kind of infinitely malleable they don't actually have a nature then we can manipulate them however we want and we can create all of a sudden all of a sudden the idea of kind of a a uh a, a utopian society where everything mm-hmm. is perfect and we can just kind of will perfection into existence and and force it into existence is entirely possible mm-hmm. because people don't actually have a nature aside from what we tell them their nature ought to be but we we define so, perfection on our own terms too it's not like it's not do. like we they have their it, own they have their own definition as to what they think perfection and, and it's is. very interesting and that's very and they don't realize that they think that they know what it is but it, it really is their own idea well, but these people think that they can enforce that on society and that that will be a utopia. Here's here's the know? thing I'm wondering. Do you think it's possible to try and advocate for the positive side of natural rights? Do you think it's possible anyone would even think of, well, I should be owed property. I should be owed the right to for, for anyone to be able to treat me how I want. I should be owed, you know, the right to freak health care. Those all of those positive sides of of those rights can only come from can only the desire for that can only be born out of inequality. The desire from that only comes when oh he has more property than I do, he has better health care than I do, he has people he is more successful and is happier than I am. Then all of a sudden you start to say, well, if I have a right to be happy, I should have a right to be as happy as he is. If I have a right to life, I should have a right to be as healthy as they are. If I have a right to property, like I have a right to be as, the, have as much yeah. as they do. So people complain about the wealth disparity in the United States without realizing that people in the lower classes are growing exponentially wealthier than they've ever been. And the wealth gap has continued to grow too, but but people who are poor are getting wealthier too. That they don't really care about that. It's not really born out of out of uh, a, a desire to. It's it's really born out of jealousy mm-hmm. fundamentally. It's not, um, hmm. you know. I would say that it's, it's got less, much less, to, much less to do with with a kind of a desire to help the poor than it is a desire to hurt the rich. A yeah, that's. I was thinking bitterness. Yeah, bitterness, resentfulness. Yeah. But I guess my point is you can't you can't get to those positive sides of the natural of of those rights without without some sort of jealousy, you know. Nobody thinks yep. nobody thinks I don't have enough if they look around and they have as much as everybody else. You know. Mm-hmm. Um nobody thinks I I should be, you know, nobody in the in the um in in the in the the middle ages looked around and saw everyone else and saw everyone living to the ripe old age of 45 and said well, this is dumb. We should be living longer than this. Nobody thought that, you know. Um, I don't know that nobody thought that. I don't know that it's true that you could assume that there's no motivation aside from jealousy for wanting more or wanting better. It could be a, a main motivation. I think today it certainly is a main motivation, but I don't know that well, you could say that that's the only it, motivation. It, it has to, if it doesn't stem from jealousy, it at least stems from the idea that things should be better than they are, and that in in some case, some there is some violation of your rights that is causing that. You know, if I think that if I was if I was in the Middle Ages, what about compassion? Do you think Do you think that it's necessary to presume that? Actually, go go ahead. Go ahead. Well, if I'm living ahead, in the Middle Ages and everyone's living to the age of forty five, and there's a couple people who are living to the age of sixty five, and I'm like, okay, they're living to the age of sixty five. Why are so many of us dying here and every all these people are living here, to this age, okay? There are a number of different avenues I can take with that, okay? Um, somebody owing me something that I'm not getting is not necessarily 
the um, me me having a right to live to the age of sixty five isn't necessarily going to come into my mind um, outside of a, a motivation of something external to myself has caused this disparity. Um, something. Do you well, think that it's necessary? And this is what sure. I was, was going to ask. Do you think it's necessary to think that? you have to have the right to this particular thing in order to to think that we ought to societally strive towards it no so for example the idea that yeah so and that's kind of what I, and these I, are two I, different I, things right if you think that yeah but but i was just i just wanted to clarify because mm-hmm. it, it sound it was sounding like you were saying that if you think that you know if if the average life expectancy is 45 and you think it should be 65 that's because you think that you have the right to your life being 65 no. it means years. you think that would be better and i guess which i wanted not to the make, same thing Right, and I guess I just wanted to make that make and clear. I, I, I think also the utopia which Josh described does not sound completely bad. It actually sounds very compelling. It sounds like a good idea. The The problem is the, the way that it's pursued. And as, as Micah just mentioned, well, the 45-65 discrepancy, I, I guess I want to... I examine the idea of motivation a bit more because I think jealousy is a possible factor in determining whether someone will will want to pursue these kind of uh, positive rights. But do you think compassion could also be a motivation? Be- well, because here's the thing. So if if I have if I'm only living to the age of 45 and I see other people living to the age of 65, I might think, well, that this is an unfair problem with society. And of course, it's personal because I'm the one that's only living to 45. But compassion might become a factor here because I, I see that there are other people like me who are only living to 45 and I feel compassion for them. And I want them, I want our society to be able to get to a point where everybody's living to 65. Or you might live to 65 and look back at somebody who's 45 and say, you know, I wish that person could live to be my age. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. So I do think that's, I, that certainly is a motivation. Whether that's kind of the, the primary motivation that's driving things today is, is I think, debatable. Mm-hmm. But it is certainly a motivation. And there are I think it's, I think it's how a lot of people feel who pursue these ideals. But I think it's become... I think the... The motivation to pursue the ideal has superseded the rational organization of the plan to put it in place. There's, there's also the sense that, um, you know, if I look at the person, if I if I did live to 65, you know, we're still given this this middle age example of the 45 and the 65. If I was living to 65 and I looked at the person who was living to 45 and I said, wow, I wish they could live to 65. At that point, all I have said is that I think things could be better than they are. I have not made any statement on whether or not... I I haven't... I could say that I think people should all be able to live to 65. Then I've made a value statement. I said things are not the way they should be. I, I haven't said things could be better. I've said things are not the way they should be. The problem is when you take it the, the next step and you say an injustice has occurred because that person is not living to the age of 65. At that point, you're assuming they have a right to live to the age of 65. They have a right, right. Hmm. to th- – there, there is an injustice that has occurred. In, in, in Typically, when we think of injustice, we think of one person committing an injustice against another. And at that point, we need to assign blame. Um, it's not because the world is broken. It's not because we, we live in this – you know, unsanitary uh, and and you know, frankly, poverty, more poverty ridden. It, it, you know, there's a little different ways you could describe it. It's not because we live in this period of history where the world is just particularly broken in such a way that people are only living this long. It's it's not it's not because of that. It's because it's because our king didn't you know um, feed didn't you know take all of our tax money and distribute food to all of us so that we would be be healthy. Mm-hmm. That's why it is. And because of that, um, I think there's an injustice that's been done. I think I have the right to live to 65, not just the, not just that it would be good if we did, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I think what you're drawing out is that 
the term injustice is often used when the term inequity or unfairness should be used instead. Well, inequity or unfairness is the objective observation. And, and we do oftentimes use the term injustice instead, but that immediately places a value on it. Um, and yeah. and, a and I can value. recognize, I can look out at the world and recognize inequity um, and, 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 you know, you know, the, 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 the wage gap in, um, in, among genders is between the genders is a great example of this. There's an inequity in the wages that men and women get paid, at least if you measure it in a certain way, but is that an injustice? Um, you know, th this need to, yeah. to view all inequities as injustices has caused everyone to start reinterpreting the world in terms of if there's something that's unequal, it's because somebody is, um, maliciously, um, doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Or perhaps even disparities, even if they aren't inequities. What's the difference between a disparity so for, and an inequity? I guess in the term, I, in the, in the ways I'm using the terms, the, just because there is a difference in what someone achieves, then there is a problem. I think what we're talking about here, just for, for people who are, who are listening here, the, 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 the better way maybe to break this down is we're talking about we're talking about inequality of outcome versus inequality of opportunity if two people end up in two different places that does not necessarily mean that there was an, a, an inequality in the systems that allowed them to do that it means that it doesn't mean that one had to be oppressed by the other or by society and so that's that's i think what we're and it's just to clarify because we're throwing around a lot of terms right now and and i think it's better no to that's kind of... that's true i mean connect that though inequality of opportunity equality of opportunity that's the negative side of the natural rights right would you agree yeah yeah so it's the idea that it's the idea that you that that if you had an inequality of op opportunity if if things if things are are equal in opportunity then the rights are preserved in a negative sense right you've you have not been you have not had a uh, uh, society or individuals working and conspiring and acting against you in order to hold you back that doesn't but it's the difference between the positive right right if you have the right to the equality of outcome that's the positive right you have the right to have the same amount of property as this person as the same as opposed to you have the right not to have your property stolen from you so right. that's the fundamental difference and it, and 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 achieving equality of one uh does not mean that you've achieved equality of the other so if you've achieved equality of outcome but in order to do that, you had to crush You may have had to crush the opportunity, the 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 the, the kind of uh, the, the equality of opportunity, right? Because if it, it maybe maybe in order to achieve equality, you had to hold somebody back in order to do that, or to steal something from that person, and give it to the other person. Yeah, and, and so those well, and, and so that's you know that's fundamentally what we're talking about here and we're, we're the only reason i'm bringing this up is we're throwing around a lot of terms mm -hmm. right now and i i feel like we ought to, i feel like we benefit from simplifying it into that this this is what we're talking yeah. about two, two well, terms quality of opportunity I, quality of outcome you're right equality of opportunity equality of outcome and here's where i see this going a lot of the emphasis on these things has has taken place in the workplace and in terms of compensation and what you deserve to be rewarded with. Where I see this going is one person works 40 hours a week and another person works 40 hours a week but is also on call. And because of that, um, the, the person who works 40 hours a week but is not on call gets paid $10 an hour and makes 400 bucks a, a week. And the other person makes $12 an hour and makes 480 bucks a week. And and there's a disparity there, right? Because they're making different amounts of money because they're, one of them's willing to be on call, the other one's not. If, if one person's willing to work 40 hours a week and make $400, another person's willing to work 80 hours a week and make $800, that also is a problem because there is a difference between $800 and $400. And why should people who work less hours be punished with less money? Right? Right. I, I could see it going there because at the end of the day, if all of these things are arbitrary in the first place, if there's why really should, no... Why should I be punished for wanting to pursue my own desires instead of 
working for some greedy corporate overlord. Right. right? I and, mean, and, we're and, hearing now. Well, it's right my now. pursuit of happiness, right? So it's yeah, you're, using you're the yes. natural right in the negative in sense. No one can impede my own personal pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. But it's it's using that as a weapon well, this is where the whole, to club someone else with. This is with. where the whole idea of a minimum wage comes from, right? It's the idea, you know, people people talk about a right to a living wage as if as if they're they're being deprived of something if they choose to choose to pursue a job that's not going to pay them enough for them to live on you know in that case you know it, it truly if nobody was willing to work minimum wage jobs then minimum there would if no one was willing to work at McDonald's for eight dollars an hour anywhere in the country um, no one if, if everybody was tr truly pursuing a living wage McDonald's would be forced to pay people. Fifteen dollars an hour, and and the reason they would be, and that's happening in in a lot of places. I mean, you know, um, in in at least in the communities where I live, being that it's a a sort of a a higher, you know, in I live in Pennsylvania, and in Pennsylvania, the minimum state minimum wage is seven twenty five. The only people who are getting paid seven twenty five are are fourteen year olds working at fast food restaurants who couldn't get hired anywhere else. Literally everyone else is making at in, at least in the area I live is making at least twelve dollars, because nobody would work for seven twenty five. Um, you don't need you know, and 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 again, this is getting into more of an economic discussion at that point. Um, we're not here arguing why we don't need a minimum wage. We're just simply arguing whether or not it's anyone has a right to it. You know, um, it's certainly not a natural right no, to it. Absolutely not. You can argue argue about whether or not there would be a benefit to instituting a minimum wage but it starts to become a problem it you know can you institute a minimum wage and without I, violating yeah. the without violating someone's natural rights i mean you're violating the natural right of the employer to choose how much they want to pay their employee you know and i think this comes back to what we were saying right at the very beginning here which is that that ultimately there is no way to enshrine a natural right legally in its positive sense without interfering with someone's natural right in in their neg in the negative sense, right? You cannot you cannot uh, grant someone property without robbing someone else of it. You cannot uh, uh, grant somebody life in the positive sense of of uh, uh, you know guaranteeing that if they get into trouble that somebody else will take care of them without for you have to in order to do that you have to either force somebody else to do that taken care of or you have to get that money from somebody else in order to take care of them you know you're you're always by enshrining rights in law in their positive sense as opposed to the negative sense you are always interfering with somebody else somebody else's rights in their in, in their negative sense which is the true the true natural right that they have so yeah. could we could we extend this to the um, the governmental handling of the coronavirus pandemic specifically? Do I have a right to not be exposed to someone who is sick? No, you don't. You have the right. You have the right to if you are worried about being exposed. You have the right to live your life in such a way so as to minimize exposure to other people who you are worried may have the coronavirus. You do not have the right to force somebody else. To live their life in such a way that minimizes their exposure to you. Do I have a right to enter into agreements with other people to minimize exposure with each other? If you enter into agreement, a mutual agreement, that's fine. Do I have a right to uh, modify an existing contract to to do such a thing? If both parties agree to it, that's fine. But you can't. You cannot. Uh, you can't trample on the rights you can't break the contract because one party is worried about it Can I, both right. parties have to am, am i am, so so i guess i'm just trying to like i'm trying to like play with the boundaries of this because um am i able to say that um as a say i own a store and i am particularly concerned about um about i'm particularly concerned about um catching this this coronavirus so i'm going to require anyone who enters into my store um to either be immunized or um to have a mask or maybe uh that sort of thing is that is that within my my rights to to choose to do that yeah if it's your store and your property nobody has the right to be on that property nobody has the right to be in your store period you could you could deny anyone access to your store for anything i'm not an advocate of of, of anybody being 
allowed into private property, private store without the permission of the owner. The owner has the right to deny anyone entry for any reason whatsoever. And if that's the reason, that's fine. And if people don't like that, there's business across the street that will take their business and give the business that denies them that service. If it's really so bad, if people really disagree with that so much, they'll go out of business. But you don't have the right to, if you're a customer, right, it goes both ways. If you're the customer, you don't have the right to shop at that store. You don't have the right to be in that building. The owner well, doesn't want you there. I, you don't get to be there. I guess that argument kind of goes back to the whole power dynamic. So what if people like that exist? And they're very prevalent. People who will just deny, be very favoritistic with the way they allow access into their facilities, into their property. I mean, take uh, that, take um, discrimination in the South. You know, you know, blacks, blacks yeah, can't exactly. use this. Could restroom. that not well? But what's could that not turn into a type of South, tyranny it, that but, goes against natural rights in and of itself? What's interesting about the discrimination in the South is that that was enforced by law. It wasn't that all the businesses just got together and decided that we're not going to allow black people into these businesses. Because you know what would have happened then, is you would have had one business that did decide to open their doors to black people and allow them in. They would have taken all of the money from the black people, and the, and the other businesses want the money, and they would go either go out of business or, you know, the competition, competition uh, uh, destroys inequality in a lot of ways. What was happening in the South was that businesses were being forced by government imposed measures to a lot of times jim crow was unwritten there were lots of measures but, within jim and, crow that were unwritten. well that's not necessarily well in some cases but in many cases what you actually had were private businesses petitioning the government to allow them to re re release those restrictions many instances of of, of group businesses and groups of businesses getting together to potential their government, they couldn't actually allow them in because of the yes. measures that were enforced by these governments. So you know it, it and, and and again in the instances where where um, if a business did want to do that, it is their right to do that. That's fine. I do think they have the right to discriminate. I think the business owner has the right to decide how his business is run. But if you don't like that, you also have the right to go open up your own business, and you'll attract you will attract uh the business that that other company doesn't want doesn't desire um and, and and so in a in a true free market um what you see more is the the elimination of of discrimination for the sake of the pursuit of profit mm -hmm. where you get into a lot of trouble is when you see this and and where things like monopolies form you're seeing this in real time right now what's happening is not that the the big tech giants you know people like to complain about the big tech giants and big corporations they're not just acting independently. You know, th there's kind of this implicit promise from the government that if you don't comply with our desires, we're not going to enshrine it in law, but we are going to come after you with every power that we have available if you do not. I mean, you're seeing this with the vaccine mandates right now. Um, you are seeing this with, you know, even go back to that, that cake shop owner, right, who denied... Uh, a service to a, a gay wedding because he was Christian and didn't want to do that. You know, it, it, and, and he, he won the case, but he's been caught up in, in legal battle after legal battle, having to pay all this money to these you know, legal, to these court battles. You know, this, this kind of implicit threat from the government that, that, you know, we will make your life as miserable as possible, even if we're not enshrining it in law, if you don't acquiesce to these things. So a lot of these businesses you know well even with the go along you know. because they just want to be left alone if they don't there's threat you know and that's where you really start to run into trouble is when you get this this horrible kind of collaboration between the big business and the big government um and 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 that's where you're really starting to get into a lot of trouble but when you don't have that when the government's actually allowing people to compete in a fair market and they're not under threat from the government of being of being punished for doing something their own way um you know, you do, you do, businesses do tend mm -hmm. to prioritize, prioritize their own profit. And what you tend to see historically is, is discriminatory practices tend to end naturally as a result of a basic profit motive. Josh, um, do you think that your argument assumes a society filled with generally moral people? Maybe it does. No, it doesn't. 
Well, in my mind, not? in my mind, it doesn't. It it doesn't. It assumes. It actually doesn't assume a society filled with more um, morally people. It assumes a society filled with self interested people. Um, mm. You know, maybe that's a better yeah. Because way. Yeah, no, I because I mean, it, it. in your society, um, it's perfectly acceptable for me to deny somebody service on the basis of whatever the whatever I want. You know, I could do, deny, deny someone service on the basis of their hair color if I wanted to. Which is just as yeah. arbitrary as skin color. Um, there's just not an ethnic connection. Um, well, not usually. I could. I, I'm sure at some point in history there has been discrimination against people with red hair. Um, no offense, Josh. Um, but um, like literal, actual discrimination against them. Um, but like in, in your society, that's per- perfectly contrary. acceptable. So there's no moral. There's no moral. <laughs> there's nothing moral. There's no moral claim tied to that. Um, you, you're just saying that it's it's the, the only moral claim there is that I should have the right to do with what I what I want with my own property. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's it, the idea it, of the natural that, right, right? Right. You 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 do have if we subscribe to the idea of natural rights as we define them in their negative sense, you do have that natural right. And so, and so what I have what property. I have the right to do is I have the right I have liberty. You know I have people in America have the liberty to be racist if they want to. You know, um, this is the this is this idea that, you know, under this under your model, people people would have the right to discriminate in the South. But truly self-interested people wouldn't do that. The reason truly self-interested people wouldn't do that is because as soon as they saw that somebody over here wants to buy a loaf of bread and this guy won't sell it to them, they'll be like, well, I'll make him a loaf of bread and then he'll buy it from me and then I'll have his business and I'll have the business of all the other people who um, can't who, who he that guy won't sell a loaf of bread to. And so then we'll all get together. Yeah, and, and so that then they'll yeah, and, I'll have all their business. And, I'll, in, and, yeah. I'll, and what's interesting about this particular model is that it, it is banking on kind of the worst aspects. It, it really does bank on kind of the worst aspects of humanity. Oh, it's terrible. And actually and, and, being able to be turned around and used as a positive. And no right? one's advocating if that you want to, well, people act this way. It's just a matter of self interested people will ultimately stop hurting each other. Well, and to tie this to tie this into free expression, but I, I also want to. Rather... Well, can I just can I just before you say that, I just want to tackle that one yeah. last thing. It's not that self interested people will stop hurting each other because you're not hurting each other. You're not hurting somebody by denying them access to your business. It's that self interested people will actively help one another in the attempt of pursuit of their own self. So long as that's not they agree on the basic natural rights. They have to agree on those natural rights. Yes. They don't agree on those but it's natural not that they're hurting. It's not that they have. It's not that they have to hurt. That's all I wanted to say, Josh. You can continue. But I just wanted to make sure that I just wanted to clarify that we're not talking about. You're not. We're not talking about somebody hurting somebody. You don't have the right under the natural rights idea to actively hurt somebody. You don't have right, the right to right, discriminate because, against somebody. I, and this is where I'm falling into them. the trap, right? Because I I just said denying somebody service would be hurting them. That's actually not true. Denying yes, exactly. somebody service, I owe them nothing. Anyway, go. Anyway, yeah. yes. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Okay, so I have two points to bring up. the The first is I agree, um, and I would rather give someone the free expression to be a racist, so that I know what's what they think and what's going through their head and what to watch out for, than to not allow any sort of external racism and just keep all of the racism under under like not monitored. That is that is to me much more disturbing than than allowing racism and then addressing significant prob- problems when they arise. Um, but but my the other point I wanted to bring up to play a bit more devil's advocate. So talking about natural rights, do you think that there is or could be a tendency for corporations to suppress natural rights in the same sense that the government could do so because that's kind of fundamental to our discussion right now it's hard to make it it, it depends on what kind of power you're talking about right? okay sure so if for a corporation instance, if a corporation does not have the power kind of imbued upon it by the government so so let's let's take we talk about the social media companies for example i, I think the big tech is maybe the best example we have of this right now right mm-hmm you might active. You might say legitimately that, um, you know, a big company like Facebook, because they control so much of the 
kind of they they control the the public square you know they control the the city center so to speak they control the methods of communication therefore they should be open in the, what they allow on their platform um you know the counter to that is kind of well there's no reason you can't kind of create your own social media platform you know so this this kind of i well to me there's to me there's two questions here right i don't believe that a corporation because because so long as the government is not involved there are the abilities to circumvent a corporation they don't have to be the only corporation around well what if have to be what if only... a corporation is the is the agency that has power and in a certain sense is functioning as a government well if 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 an if a corporation is functioning as a government then it's it's a government if all well, you have isn't but I think that's not a that's not what, a can you tiny give me an point of because that? Like, sure, and I'm not speaking necessarily of of legal power, although that is often where corporations find their ability to suppress things. But well, monopolies, for instance. Well, money money is a driving factor, as we mentioned, for these 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 um, corporations, and so of course it's going to drive them. And usually, what that means is that individuals will not like them if they are being racist uh, well and... what is a monopoly because the i i uh, some i think we i think we've kind of come to define monopoly as a society as just a corporation that's gotten bigger than we think that it should have but typically a monopoly that... has has control over uh, a, uh enough of the enough of the resources in a given field to be able to be the sole the right. sole distributor and of i, I don't those i don't know of a single company even the biggest big tech companies out there that everybody's so worried about all the time, and, and maybe legitimately so. I mean, listen, I'm a big anti big tech, you know, privacy and security advocate. But but there's none of those big companies that offer anything that I couldn't get elsewhere, right? If I don't like Google, I don't have to use Google. They're yeah, not because monopoly. you have I have the... alternatives to them. Yeah, if but I that's don't because like Facebook, of the society we live Facebook. in that has natural rights as its. As it's kind of yes, but but here I guess here's I guess here's my point. You can't find a society with a monopoly like that, a genuine monopoly like that, where the government is not directly involved in the creation and 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 sustaining of that monopoly. It doesn't exist. Would you in 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 a free market society? there well, is, I, I would I would challenge you on the creation because often the government does not create monopolies. No, but, but they but they do. They are what allows them to exist. They they can, yes. a monopoly like that can only exist if all competition is is forcibly suppressed by the government. And 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 so you can is that find what happened with, the only instances um, where you can find genuine monopolies. Is is that what happened with uh, with uh, Rockefeller? Uh, and and uh, what was his? Uh, well, if you have what was his oil company? If called? you have a government. If you have a government that issues, that decides that we're going to issue a contract, we're going to decide the winner here. We've got a job that we want done, or we've got a big job in the case of some of these, you know, you, you talk about some of the kind of monopolies in American history. I mean, what happens here is that the government picks a winner. They decide who sure, gets to but be they the could, winner here. They could they pick the winner, winner on the basis of who has the best offer, and sometimes that might be the biggest, bigger and company. And they could do that, too. And, and in such cases, are and, they and really so it, contributing it, to the creation of a monopoly, or are they just really another... An, another... Could, but could, you call, could you actually call that a monopoly? If there's other options, if I, have pri if I as a private citizen... No, of course not. ...want to use the... Or as if my private business want to interact with one of these companies, it doesn't matter to me if the government has, has you know hired a particular company mm -hmm. right yeah i don't know that you could really even call that a, a proper monopoly you know what we're talking about here is like you know you go to a, a, some communist country and you know okay well well where do you want your newspapers from well there's one newspaper company they're owned by the government or they're they're the only company they're the government official newspaper company and all the other ones are outlawed like that's a monopoly pretty sure know? britain has one of those you, but so you can't you know you can't if we're talking again, so I, I don't know what the, yeah, I guess I don't, I don't see, I don't see the, the existence of companies that are larger than we would like them to be and that we don't like as, as being monopolies just because we don't like them or we think that they're too big. No, it's, it, it, it's a, a truly a monopoly would have to be so big that it's impossible to, um, it's impossible for competition to arise. That's really what it has to be. Um. And if it, 
it, it, it would, it would be, you would probably be hard pressed to come up with a situation where that was truly, truly the case. Um, but you would, you could look at some, some situations in the industrial revolution, um, specifically, uh, of companies that got to be very, very large and controlled a, a, a very specific resource to the point where there was no longer um, any competition and they were able to stomp out any competition that reared its head. Um, not necessarily because, again, I, I, we, we wouldn't know, none of us would have any of the historical knowledge to be able to say whether or not the government could have done how, things how, to make that more long, free. If we, say that, if we say that a company like that existed, where there was legitimately no complicate competition, there was no one else you could go to, and I don't know that we actually have an example of we that might in not. history, but if we could point to an example of that, how long did that last? Like, seriously, like you say they, they couldn't crush out any competition. How many of those giant companies that you hear about in your history books are still around today? Like, none of them are, right? They all got out-competed eventually. There's no such thing. Or as broken up by the U.S. government. In, in it, yeah, there's no, there's no such thing in, in a free society of kind of this eternal monopoly that is never has any no. competition and never well, has and any I alternatives to maybe you could perhaps make the argument that there is no free society in which that would be allowed to happen no i mean i mean or rather a society free not that it has to be allowed, to, be allowed to happen it's just that it's not possible I mean, if you, in a genuinely yeah. free free society there will always be people who will come up with alternatives and that's if it's thing. a profitable industry somebody else is going to want to get into it somebody else is going to put their hat in the ring there's always going to be competition between human beings you will never have an instance even in the biggest companies that we have today you will never have an instance where you can only ever buy stuff from amazon but it just won't so there's, happen so there's the biggest guy and they have the most resources because they've been accumulating them and they want to control the in industry they don't want anyone else getting into it so what does a smaller a smaller business do that wants to get in on this thing do when it doesn't have the resources to fight this bigger company for access to this, this they make industry? good products i mean seriously like i don't but know they, i don't know what if any they company don't have that, access to the resources necessary to make i don't products. know i would need to find an actual instance of that because i don't know what well, you, we're just people what we're say describing that, but, is a purely free society in which the government does not but yeah interfere but like, but like these let's what are the biggest what are the companies. biggest companies in the u.s right now right because we got we actually need to talk about some actual examples of this we need some I, evidence. Well, but, if we're talking about the biggest companies that we have let's 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 say google amazon, amazon uh, uh disney they have they all have competition their competition is all very successful they don't have nearly they don't have a, a tiniest if you look at like duckduckgo search engine as opposed to google duckduckgo does not have a a a, a percent of the resources that Google does, it has probably it has maybe a hundred thousandth of the re if that would be generous a hundred thousand. Yeah, they've got nothing right, and yet they manage to hold, and yet they manage to provide a very decent sir a very decent alternative to Google's search services, right? Like I I don't know I don't know I don't believe that this disparity of resources means that the smaller companies can't come along and compete. I don't have right. any I can't think of any example of any of the biggest companies that we've ever had. Where a smaller company with with a, a minute percentage of the resources of that larger well, company and can't create a service that is is so just as I, good. I think you might be right, and that's that's be partially at least because of our the amount of technology we have nowadays, as well as the nationalizing of products. When you but even before that, when even you, before that, you couldn't get that big. Because then you couldn't go national with your product. There was no, well, yes, there was but, no but possibility of something like Amazon there, or Google there are, coming out. There are out a lot of examples, 1800s. and I can't give you any names, of, but of companies taking over entire towns and basically owning them because maybe no towns. one else had access to those maybe, resources. Maybe and this was something that was... towns, but, but not, not in any kind of grand I, I have a, I have a question that, that I'd, I'd, oh, like, hi, to, I'd <laughs> like to ask here. Um, does it matter... Does it matter whether or not a monopoly could truly exist? Does it matter whether or well, not we're not full? We're not. No, no. My point here, not really talking about mo monopolies as much as about whether about whether corporations can hinder natural rights in the same way that government can. Okay. Uh, again, I, I think I think the argument that I was making is that that can't happen. Unless there's an actual genuine monopoly that controls all of them, and, and, and I have yeah. never seen an example of that. And, and if it, I, I cannot find. I need an actual example of that in order to even, in order for, in order for the argument that that 
a company could do that. I would need, I would need, as, yes, so long as one of those companies existed, and one, not one of those companies has never existed in the history of our country. But but if a company did exist like that, are they are they they've effectively put themselves in a position where they are? It, no, they, they are, are the, the government, government at that point. Yes, um, right. and in that in that circumstance, and th- that's a that's another interesting question here is is does a government have the right to make laws against that would prevent other governments from rising up within itself you know right um, and and could could they do that without violating the natural rights of the citizens um is a is a, is an interesting yeah. question because theoretically if another government does rise up and we're we're talking about a constitutional system and 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 in we i think the only co- we could talk about this too, but the only system that could exist where the, the 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 three primary values are life, liberty, and the pursuit of property is a constitutional system whereby the government exists by the will of the people and by the consent of the people. I mean, our, our government started out having 13 separate governments right. arise within itself. So it, obviously, I think the answer to that is that you know, a government that really actually respects those things does allow for self-governance on local communities. That's what you see in any now, country. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting question. Does government itself, does democratic representative government in some way violate the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Because in, in a democratic system, in, a, in, a, in any sort of, we'll say, representative system, whether it's democratic or, or more of a republic, where, whereby the interests of the people are represented. The re- interests of the people are not represented in any way that fully satisfies the desires of the people who are being represented. In other words, I might have liberty as an individual, but in terms of what the government, what I, in my interest in the government and what the government's doing, I may not have the same interest, the same desires the same pursuits that i would like to see see involve occur in the government as uh billy job bo over uh uh billy billy job uh billy bob joe over there who happens to be the one who's um who's voted for the guy who's in office you know um i think we're going to be getting into a separate conversation okay. here um, not that I don't, not that I don't think that's a conversation worth having, having, but I think that we're going to start going into it. You know, if, if, if the conversation starts out here as an idea of, of the kind of enshrining of natural rights in, in law, as opposed to the, or how, to what extent that, that would, would contradict with the, uh, kind of the actual natural rights, you know, the kind of legal rights versus natural rights. Um, I think what we're going to start getting into is more of a conversation about, I mean, number one, what is the role of government? Which I think we we started talking about last time. I think I think I think we're starting to deviate into a separate. I guess I guess my there. my question is we well I I also think that part of what you're bringing up, Micah, just goes right back to the the um negative versus positive rights. So you're what you're saying, basically what you're bringing up is, do people have the right to happiness or do they have the right to the pursuit of happiness? And right, the founding fathers well, they had the right to pr- okay. the pursuit of happiness, not to the fact that they would be represented in every single one of their interests and ha- and be happy at all times that's never been I guess right. my question is more do we have those rights as a society or do we have those rights as individuals because if i'm if i'm going to make as a individuals government, but here's the thing if i'm going to not as a society okay, but here's the thing if i'm going to make a government and i want to um in a in a constitutional system this is why i think this is related and it's not it, it is a little bit of a separate a separate sort of discussion, but it's it's also related very much to what we're talking about. If I have these these natural rights and and no one can impede on those natural rights. So no one can take my life, no one can take my liberty, and no one can take my property. Um without my being a participant in that action. So um no one can become a part of my life without my consent. Nobody can stop me from doing what I want to do to um, pursue liberty without my consent. Nobody can um, take my property without my consent. The thing is, in a constitutional system, we each give up certain rights, if you will. We each give up a certain um, 
piece of that. You know, I give up my right to property in as much as I agree to pay taxes. I give up my right to liberty in as much as I agree that um, when I'm, you know, and and, and that you can get into some different things, you, you know. Like eminent domain. Eminent domain, driving laws, although then there's a contract involved with being on the road, which is owned by the government. This, this, It gets into a very complicated discussion. I guess my point is mm-hmm. we do agree to give up certain rights as part of a constitutional system. What about when the collective, the government, the 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 whole society decides we're going to give up a certain right. We're going to give up a little we're going to give up a little bit of this so that we can have this. What what happens to me as an individual if I disagree with that? What happens to me is what if if my natural right is um to to, to not think, give up property, that, why don't I get to choose how much taxes I pay? I, I think that the line that is drawn here is that so take the example of eminent domain, right? It would be grossly unjust and it would be a violation of human rights if the government had the right to come along because the collective agrees or votes on something if the collective agrees that we need to build a new highway through here. And the government comes along and they say, okay, and they say, okay, we've decided that we need to build a highway here. We're going to therefore take this house away from you. It would be grossly unjust if they just booted you out of your house and mowed your house down, right? What would be, what, what, where the line comes in is that if in the instances where by, for the interest of society, kind of on the agreement of the collective, a right has to be in, infringed upon in that kind of way, there has to be equal compensation. So they can't just take away your house. They have to pay you exactly what your house is worth, and they, you have to be able to be established and set up somewhere else. You can't just come around and, and, and de-house somebody. In, in the instance have they not, of, have of they not, though, taxation... Have they not encroached on my liberty, of, though, when they took my house? I wanted my house to be there. Well, if if there if we're going to if we're going to presume that there has to be some kind of government action, then the answer is no. The answer, the thing, something like taxation, sure. for example, right? If you're being taxed beyond that which you are benefiting from from the tax, what the taxes are getting you, then that's unjust. That's injustice. I think we're to that point now. A lot of people oh, sure. are paying far more than what they're getting out of the system. But if you're if you're paying taxes in order to receive benefits that we as a society have decided are benefits that we want to pursue. Then that's but okay. I haven't decided what that as an individual. Is, the society has decided that, and maybe, maybe, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should have no taxes. Maybe there should be no eminent domain. Maybe well, that's, maybe all, that's actually well, but all all democracy really be. gives you is the right to express your opinion and hope that everyone else shares your opinion. It doesn't give you the right to have the final say because that would be tyranny. And it so does if become... you, and so if the collective decides that they would prefer to. Um, have a higher tax and have cleaner roads and you would not prefer that well the collective has decided because you had your voice they had their voices and that's how a democracy works the, the more the more firm examples to me is something like a police force like if, if we if we decide that we need to tax people in order to have a police force we have to have a, we decide collectively that we want to have a police force to protect people or a military to protect people or a fire department to to protect people is it a violation of your rights if you personally don't want to be taxed for that you know and 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 to me and to me it seems like if we're going to allow for any kind of if 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 there is to be a government can't even protect those natural rights that you have without having some form of ability to act right we have to allow in order for the government to be worth existing at all it has to be able to act so we have to find a way to to allow the government to act in a way that is as non-violative of the rights as humanly possible in order to prevent that. So, right? so I think the in- I'll stop playing devil's advocate for a second um, and, and sort of give what I think might be the answer to this question. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't, I was, I was truly trying to get to this. I wasn't, it wasn't like I had this in my head and I was, I was just leading you on. Um, I think that there has to be on a fundamental level, an agreement from the individual to participate in the in the society, to participate in the in the government that that is is operating, um, because otherwise, and you have to agree to do it regardless of the fact that sometimes you're not going to like the outcome, and you're going to have to agree to participate in the outcome regardless of the fact that you don't like it, and that's where we get to a really interesting question because at what point 
can you start to really not participate in the society that you have agreed mm-hmm. to participate in because it is it is violating more of your rights than you signed up for mm-hmm. um and that is uh that's an interesting question um another interesting question would be do you have do you actually get a choice as to whether or not you participate in that society and if you don't participate in that society what are the alternatives do you have a free choice to participate in that society or not um and that's a that's another interesting question but um anything else you guys want to talk about before we sort of wrap this up for the day i think no, this is I'm... definitely a good yeah. good direction yeah i think that's i think that's a good uh probably a good place to leave it for today cool all right well we'll call this the end of the podcast and uh, we'll continue a similar topic uh, next week thanks guys you've been listening to another philosophical tuesday a production of the intellectual stooges thank you for listening and we hope you'll join us again next tuesday for another episode 